we've talked about first order linear systems, so homogeneous systems that have this form. Now, this linear system, like any other linear problem, enjoys a lot of benefits. So all the linearity properties we've discussed, uh, matrix vector notation can be used in a system like this, all the existence and uniqueness results we, we've come up with, and even something as basic as we think of as solution formulas. When we have linear problems, when we have linear systems, all of those things become available to us. Now, fortunately, many problems are applications of this. So things like electric circuits and mixing tanks, etc., etc. There are many applications of linear systems. However, not everything in the world is linear. Linear systems are not the be-all and end-all. We study them first because they're easy. We can come up with a lot of results. And when we encounter them, we want to be prepared. We are also going to use them to help us study what are called non-linear systems. So as an application of something that is not linear, let's take a look at, first of all, a pendulum. So a pendulum is some mass that's attached to a, a rigid, inflexible rod, and then it swings back and forth. So it just follows some circular arc like this, swings back and forth, and there's some angle that's formed between them. And this type of mechanical system is fairly simple, but if you go ahead and you use Newton's laws and you break it up into vector components, one in the radial direction and one in the angular direction, what happens is that you can come up with a nonlinear differential equation. So the second derivative of this angle here, the, the variable that talks about the position of the pendulum, this is going to lead you to a nonlinear equation. And it's nonlinear because of the sine theta. Now, for small angles, we often use the Maclaurin series expansion for sine, and we replace it like this, and this is what's called a linearization. But if we don't want to linearize it, what we find here is that we keep the sine theta term. It is no longer linear. Now, you can write this as a system, and you can do the same trick that we've always done. You can say, let u equal theta prime, and that means u prime would be theta double prime, would be negative g over l sine theta. And so you end up with a linear system. You'll have theta prime is u, or sorry, a nonlinear system. Theta prime is u, and u prime is negative g l over a time sine theta. This is a nonlinear system. And it comes up very naturally through Newton's laws. So there is one simple example of where nonlinearity comes in. Another interesting one here is what are called predator-prey models. Now we've talked about population modeling. Now population modeling, so let's say we've got uh, x of t is going to be the number of rabbits in a population, and y of t will be the number of sheep. Now this necess isn't necessarily what's called a predator-prey model because the rabbits and the sheep don't feed on one another. This is what's called a competition model. Now, in a competition model like this, these two populations are coexisting, but they compete for the same resources. And when they compete for the same resources, we have to somehow incorporate that competition into a model. So if these populations were left alone, they would generally follow logistic growth. And if you remember from non-autonomous or from autonomous first order DEs, logistic growth is some kind of curve that behaves like this. All the populations eventually tend to what's called this carrying capacity. And it's a realistic model where you've got some sort of nonlinear growth like this. You could say, okay, there is this value there. That would be if the populations were left alone, they would follow logistic growth. But if you 
want to couple them, if you want to incorporate one with the other, we need to add additional terms. We need to add an additional competition term. And that competition term is going to depend on both populations. They're competing per, for food, so the presence of the other species causes some problems. So we could say something like this, the population of rabbits is going to follow a logistic pattern or a logistic growth. You just simplify the model here. Some sort of logistic growth pattern in this form. And there would be a competition term. And this competition term would depend on both the population of the rabbits and the sheep. And similarly, the sheep would have their own term. So you could say something like gamma y, 1 minus y. There would be logistic growth if the sheep population, population was left alone. And then there'd be a competition term. And so once again, you've got a non-linear system. And so these are meant to be two relatively intuitive examples, relatively straightforward examples to show you that, hey, it is natural for nonlinear systems to come into play. Now note, in a nonlinear system, you can't write it in matrix vector form. Nonlinear systems cannot be written as x prime equals some matrix AX. It's not possible. In the pendulum example that we talked about, we had the following. Theta prime is U, and U prime is negative G over L sine theta. Well, there's no matrix that we can use to deal with this, because typically, if we were to say, okay, the vector here is theta in U, there's no matrix that allows us to deal with this. Cannot incorporate this into a linear equation. So the best we can do is just a straight sort of vector notation. If we take our system and we write it as theta and u, that'll be our vector x, we'll find that the derivative here, x prime, is some vector function of the vector x. That's how we're going to end up writing all of these linear systems. It's some vector field. And all of our problems like this are vector fields, and these are first order nonlinear autonomous systems. So these are first order nonlinear autonomous systems. And those are the ones we're going to study here. And we're just going to do a brief introduction. If you continue on in your studies in math, there are courses in a field called dynamical systems that really go in depth into how to deal with nonlinear problems and nonlinear systems. And why do we need another course entirely? Because what we're going to find is that nonlinear systems are hard. I'm just going to scroll this result down here. So the point here, nonlinear systems are hard to solve explicitly. Solving them explicitly other than let's say decoupled and even even in a decoupled it would still be challenging to solve so nonlinear systems are hard to solve we are straight away we are going to abandon the hunt for formulas we are not going to bother saying oh let's say explicit formulas we aren't going to bother with that with nonlinear systems, the equations are just too complicated that there's just no point to try to find some form for this and some form for this. Just get rid of it. We're not going to bother with that. We're going to focus on a qualitative analysis 
and we are going to use a lot of phase plane analysis. The phase plane is going to be our friend, and sometimes we can compute equations for trajectories. Now we've already had a little taste of this when we talked about first order nonlinear problems. So sometimes we're going to be able to compute equations for trajectories in the phase plane. And that's about the best we're going to be able to do. Now some theoretical results here. And this is something that I'm calling theorem 8.0.1. It doesn't really matter what it is, but essentially it's some sort of limited existence and uniqueness theorem. It's limited because of the way that the statement of this theorem works. So if we give this nonlinear system in vector field form, and we supply an initial condition, there is a condition on that vector field. So if that vector field here has continuous partial derivatives like this for all the different variables in some open set, then there exists a unique solution to this initial value problem on some time interval. Well, that's not the greatest. It's not so great because we don't know what that time interval is. We don't know how long it is. The best that this tells us, this tells us that solution curves don't crisscross in the phase plane. So solution curve trajectories won't usually cross in the phase plane at some points. But even then, we don't really get too much. And when I say usually, that isn't always the case. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. So this is very limited here. We aren't going to read too much into this. Now generally, nonlinear systems have interesting behavior. What do I mean by that? What do you mean by interesting behavior? Well, nonlinear systems contrast very differently. When we have a linear system, a linear system is always able to be written in this nice form. x prime equals ax. There's only one equilibrium solution. And the one equilibrium solution is x equals zero. This is the one constant solution that when you plug into the right-hand side and the left-hand side, you'll always get a constant solution. And in this case, it's always going to be one of the following. It's always going to be either a sink or a source, perhaps a center, perhaps a spiral, perhaps a saddle, and perhaps one of these nodes. We went through, and we went through all of those different cases in the previous topics, right? But nonlinear systems are more interesting. I've just put in some typical, or what I, not typical, but interesting pictures here. I put in some interesting pictures of nonlinear phase portraits. And I chose these because they kind of look cool. And because they illustrate some important differences. In this first picture here, what's going to go on is what you'll be able to observe is that nonlinear systems have many equilibrium points, or they potentially can. You can have more than one. In systems like this, you can have sort of patterns for the trajectories that are not 
like the ones for linear systems. This thing is something interesting. This is called a limit cycle. Now, a limit cycle isn't one of the types of curves that you get from a linear system. Nonlinear phase portraits are much more interesting, and because of that, it's difficult to, again, solve them explicitly. So we're going to focus on trying to come up with the standard set of tools that we've got. We're going to try to use direction fields and a qualitative analysis. Those are our main tools. And once we've got that going, the nice thing is it's very similar to what you did for first order single nonlinear equations. Those nonlinear autonomous equations, you can deal with things very similar in this case. And that's how we're going to approach.